Hey, you guys, guys and bums, and welcome back to A Few Bad Men. All right. So today, I'm just going to be doing some more of the newspaper stuff from the Castellamarese War, what the newspaper said about the Castellamarese War. I know I still have episode five, the last episode, but I'm still researching and doing some stuff. I, I'm, I really want to, you know, do it right. All right. So just be patient with that. But for right now, I'm just going to drop a little few of these videos for you uh, just as like follow up. All right. So I found in the Standard Union, October 24th, 1930, uh, the story about Joe Aiello all right, in Chicago. And it says uh, two machine gun squads kill gangster caught in crossfire. Chicago chieftain falls with 32 bullets was Capone's rival ambushed as he's left his hideout after Lingle murder. Oh, OK. After the Jacob Lingle murder. I don't know if they if he has something to do with that, but anyway, so it says uh, his all right. So it says that uh, the only witness was James P. Ruin, a taxi driver, who had been called to the apartment where Aiello, who who like many other gang leaders, had been a fugitive since Al Alfred Ning Alfred Lingle was killed on June 9th and was in hiding. Ruin entered the hallway, found the bells out. Uh, okay, so Ruin entered the hallway and found the, the doorbells out of order and he kicked on the corridor door to notify his fair that he had arrived and he started back to his cab. The fair who was Aiello followed about 15 feet in the rear. Burst of flames. As he opened the cab door, the driver heard a noise across the apartment courtyard. He turned and saw a window opening slowly. A cumbersome looking object was laid across the sill. There was a burst of flame. As the courtyard rang with the roar and the echo of machine gun fire and the crack of splintering wood and shattering glass, Ayalo staggered, shouted something unintelligible, glared for a moment, terrified at the machine gun, at the machine gun nest, then turned around, half ran, half stumbled around the corner into a narrow court. There he halted, as if to congratulate himself on his escape. But his enemies had anticipated he might just use this avenue of escape. There was a second burst of gun. There was a second burst of fire, and this one from the rear of the narrow court. Wow. I said the, the roar of the machine gun in the little enclosure was deafening. It continued for a moment. Echoes followed. As the clamor died out, deathly silence followed. Ruin ran from behind his cab. Motorcycle policeman Charles Fuller, who lives a block away, had heard the shots and joined the cab driver as they placed Aiello's body into a cab and took it to the hospital. Wow. So, <laughs> wow, Aiello really got lit up. They really described it too, uh, more than any book that I've ever read. And this is my first time reading it too. I'm just uh, finding this out. I just wanted to share it with you. And um, they broke into the apartment where the bullets had been fired and they found evidence of a group of men had been waiting there for days and were preparing Oh, and prepared to wait many, many more days if necessary to get Ayala on the spot. Said they had plenty of food and uh, had, a, had a left food to last for a month, the officer said. On the table was evidence of the gangsters. He said on the table was the evidence of what the gangster does as he waits for his enemy to appear. There were used plates, many cigarette stubs, the paper cups from a box of candy, a plate half filled with scrambled eggs, <laughs> a cup half full of coffee. Officer con officers concluded that the apartment where room was called one of a number of hiding spots which Aiello had used since June when the Lingle murder, when the Lingle murder created such a, a furor that it became unsafe for any gangster to continue frequenting his older boats. Wow, so that's what they said about Joe Aiello. That's really... <laughs> That's really cool. I'm, I'm learning some stuff there, too. That's why I like reading, reading these newspapers. I'm going to leave the link down there. You know, I don't really want to give up my, 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 my sources, you know, but it's so, it's so interesting that if you want to read them, you know, you can read them yourself. If not, I'll be here to read them for you, you know, and you can drop a like and bump off that subscribe button, and, I, and I'll do it for you. All right. But uh, let's see who we got on... Uh, Joe Giuseppe Morello, the clutching hand. Okay. If you guys haven't voted for the next video series, then 
you need to go back and check out episode four of the Castle of Marese War and, and find out what you need to do to vote. All right. Okay, so the Times Union, 15th of August, 1930. Two killed, one wounded in gang war. Two men were killed and one critically injured in a sudden renewal of Harlem gang warfare late today when gangsters burst suddenly into a small real estate office in which the three were talking business, fired a fusillage of shots and disappeared into the crowded streets. The dead are described as Pedro Morello. Say that, that's, they were calling him Pedro. At this time, he was going by Peter Morello and not Giuseppe Morello, but, uh, or, or Pedro, I guess they you know, you can see. So, uh, said to be a relative of Cyril Terranova, the artichoke king, notorious gangster and Joseph Terreno. They say Terreno, but it's actually Pereno. All right. The addresses of both men are both uh, unknown. The third man is Caspar Talaro. Again, it's Polaro, but you know, they, they call him Talaro. Of 14, 20, 1442 Charles Street in the Bronx, who was in critical condition at the Harlem Hospital. He told the detectives of the East 104th Street station that, that he and his companions were seated in the room when the rear door opened and suddenly a battery of revolvers appeared and the shots were fired. The assailants disappeared down the stairs into the streets. He said he, he declared that he did not know the man nor why they should shoot him or his companions. Okay, let's see. That was the Times Union. Uh, the Standard Union says so apparently there was some type of book found outside of the murder outside a kid found a book so it says uh drop book gives clues to dual murder police seek two men fleeing from a box from a box office in brooklyn 50 names listed in a little black book 50 names listed in the little black book picked up in the streets by a boy <laughs> formed the chief's clues today through which the police sought to identify the slayers of the two contractors and the wounding of a third yesterday in the, in the new outbreak of the Bronx Building Racket War. Bronx Building Racket War. So they're talking about, see, they don't understand uh, what's going on between the, the Castle Marese and Joe and them. So they just know that, you know, all right, he's in the, he's a real estate guy, so he must be trying to take over the, the building racket. So. Let's pull him in, a, you know, he's a building racketeer, and that's why he got killed. They're trying to figure everything out. Um, it says, uh, okay, police are also seeking two men described to them by a woman who saw the gunman flee from the scene in a double murder at a building at 352 East 116th Street, Manhattan, after they killed Peter Morello, formerly known as The Clutch, and Joseph Pereno, who ex expected to sail for Italy today. Oh, wow. Joseph Pereno was supposed to be going to Italy that day. <laughs> wow. That's, that's, that's pretty messed up. The book handed the police, the book handed to the police by a boy outside the building which the shooting occurred, lists large sums opposite each name it contained. So if they would say who was in the book, uh, they could probably figure out who it is sounds like a, a Shylock book, you know. The guy, you know, who's, who owes me money. <laughs> it goes on to say the shootings occurred in Morello's office and broke up the business conferences between the three contractors. Fifteen shots were fired by two gunmen who entered the barely furnished office with, with drawn revolvers. Twenty minutes later, Benjamin Prince described as described by police officers as a small-time gambler and narcotics expert was shot to death in the same street. He was killed as he entered a Hungarian restaurant at Lenox Avenue and 116th Street by a lone assailant who likewise escaped. Wow, it's a rough day. Um, all right. It says, uh, Morello was killed first. Pushing their way into the Clutch Hands headquarters late yesterday, the murderers first killed Morello, pausing in the doorway only long enough to take aim before they fired. They, then they turned their guns over his body and shot Pereno, who leaped from a second story window with a bullet through his chest. He died before help could reach him. 
Polaro was the last of the trio to fall. He was seriously wounded. Police expected him. Police expected to question him today. Physicians said he may die, and he, he eventually died. All right. So, wow. Wow. I love the way these reporters uh, word things. And if I'm, you know, I'm stumbling over the words just because I'm reading it for the first time too. And we're, just, you know, I'm just trying to give you guys the this the unadulterated skinny. All right, so let me see. What do they say about Joe the Boss? So they, Joe doesn't really appear in the papers until uh, 1928 or something like that. Uh, there's one time in 1922 he appears and uh, it's after Valente tried to kill him on uh, Grand Street the first time in front of the police station but it's not it's not one of these Brooklyn papers it's, a, it's another newspaper it's a, a New York New York paper okay so this is the Brooklyn Times Union all right gang what uh, April 16th 1931 Gang war looms in Coney slang of Joe the Boss. Murder of racketeer, figure, and dozen killings may draw reprisals from pals. If Giuseppe Mazzaria had half as many friends as the enemies who tried for 10 years to eliminate him from the racketeering scheme of things, then Harlem sector is due for a lot of shooting in the immediate future. That was only the positive belief today of detectives who investigated the murder yesterday of Masseria in a Coney Island restaurant. Masseria, better known as, better known to the underworld as Joe the Boss, was shot five times by gunmen as he sat in Gerardo Scarpato's restaurant at 2715 West 15th Street. Otherwise, the police were completely at sea for a definite motive or a clue to the killers of the man who has been dominating the rackets in Harlem and dodging bullets all over New York for more than half a decade. They say that uh, Joe the Boss died by a typical formula of gangland's killings. He was put on the spot. Friendly enemies, uh, that's, that's cool. Friendly enemies lured him to the Coney Island restaurant, presumably members of, of a bodyguard he had trusted. Seated at a card table in Scarpato's place, the boss was about to play the ace of diamonds when five bullets brought him down. All right. Uh, uh, it goes on to say uh, he was an underworld power. A legend of power and glamour surrounded the boss while he lived. The tales of his rackets and enemies served only to confuse the police in the efforts to solve the slaying today. He had been called the arch enemy of Ciro Terranova, the artichoke king. Yet he broke bread with Ciro at the now famous Magistrate Vitale testimonial dinner. I got to do a video on that. There's so much on that. I thought it was a small thing. But apparently, back in that time, that uh, meeting where it was robbed, it was held by Sarah Terranova and it was robbed, that meeting was a, a big deal in New York at that time. So I'm going to I'm gonna do a whole uh, another episode on that. I'm sorry. So, uh, testimonial dinner. He was supposed to have sworn foe. He's supposed to have been a sworn foe to Al Capone. Yet he was an active agent in Capone's domination of the Union Sicilian. Oh. Uh, I see. Uh, it said, all that is officially known of the boss, however, is that he had been the target of hundreds of bullets until yesterday managed to dodge them all. It says when Frankie Yale was arrested, him and little Augie were brought in for questioning. Excuse me. And uh, actually, so Joe the boss was under a $35,000 bond as a material witness in the Alfred Mineo and Steve Ferrigno trial, uh, case. I don't understand if they, they brought him in, thought that he was, uh, thought that he was a part of it, but he was, yeah, he was brought in and they had him as, uh, as a material witness. So there's another paper that I really wanna find 
and I can't, I can't seem to find it. I was looking for it before I started this. Um, they talk about Joe the Boss being, this is months before he died, actually. They talk about him being a, 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 a fish, that he controlled all the fish and seafood in New York. That um, that was his, that was his racket. So back in the, back in that time, it was a lot of rackets going on. Any legitimate business, it seemed like. Um, I know I can find this thing. Any legitimate business, it seemed like, could be uh, corrupted. And these these early gang leaders or so-called gang leaders were really businessmen who used their connections in the underworld to make their legitimate businesses better, like like uh, Rihanna. All right, Rihanna had the ice business, but he used his gang to muscle out everybody else who was in the ice business. And then, you know, so now he has a criminal organization that's working to, you know, further his, his legitimate business. Uh, so Joe the Boss, he had, he, he had the fish rackets, and that makes sense because in the 30s, the guy who ran the fish markets was a, a, a Genovese soldier, um, Sox Lanza. So that makes sense that, you know, that would be his territory. And it may not be him taking it over, but one of his guys working under his name. All right. Uh, October 31st, they're talking about business. So they, they also talk about uh, his son saying that he wasn't uh, a gangster. I don't know why I can't find that. But they talk, they talk about him not being a gangster and that he was just a, a businessman and a, a, a fish salesman. So they talk about him, I, I, I'm, I don't understand why I can't find that particular newspaper, where they talk about him um, being being the one who, who settled disagreements in the, 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 the unions of all the fish people. And he was the person that you had to go see when you wanted to um, get something done. Oh or settle some uh, union business. Settle some union business within the, uh, the the fish union stuff. I'm sorry, I'm trying to read this and, and do this at the same time. This is all like live. I'm not really looking. I mean, I'm not really, uh, you yeah. know. You guys know what I'm talking about. You know, I'm trying to read and, and talk at the same time, so it's kind of confusing sometimes. But, uh, all right. So, if I find it, this video is already 20 minutes almost. So, if I find it, I'll, 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 I'll put it in there. But, hey, listen, guys, I got, I found so much stuff reading these newspapers. I got so much good stuff for you guys coming down the road. I can do whole episodes on guys just based on what, what I got in the newspapers. So make sure you go back and check out the Castellum Marese 4 video and uh, vote based on the three choices you got in that video to uh, for the next episode, I mean, for the next series of episodes. And uh, I'll get into it. But hey, man, I, I, I'm pulling for a specific video because I want to give you guys what I found in these papers, but I'm going to leave it up to you and whichever video wins is the one. All right. So again, this is just a little video. I'm, I'm not doing too much editing. If the reading is a little off, it's because I'm reading at the same time and trying to do a bunch of stuff. So forgive me for that. But I just wanted to get this information out to you guys. All right. So this has been a few bad men. Keep your nose clean and don't take any wooden nickels. I see you in the funnies.